rise of the machines. They're increasingly shoving humans aside in the workplace, but robots are also helping us work and live longer while creating opportunities where jobs are scarce. So how can we make the most of artificial intelligence? This is Inside Story. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jane Dutton. They build, cook and clean for us and increasingly work for us. So much so that Oxford University predicts almost half of US jobs will be done by machines and robots within the next 20 years. And then there's the next wave of technology, smarter artificial intelligence and augmented reality. It's a future leaving many people concerned and confused while others see endless potential. Our guests will help us explore the opportunities shortly. But first, Sahel Rahman reports from Japan on how robots are helping humans earn money into their twilight years. Japan's older community know how to keep active. Even in retirement, they're always on the move. This logistics company employs more than 700 across its sites. Some of its workers, like 57-year-old Kenji Takemura, have a tough job. He's been working here for more than 34 years. Loading and unloading, carrying and bending from containers like these can take its toll. Since 2014, the company has invested in this exoskeleton. It takes the strain off Kenji's main joints and supports him in his tasks. The burden on my legs and back has been lessened by half and I can do the same work over a long period of time. I hope I can continue for 10 more years. That's what the government would like to see, people working beyond retirement age. The findings of the recent national census suggest Japan's population will fall dramatically over the next few decades. With an aging population and fewer young people to replace them, some academics think finding a fit and capable workforce will become an issue. So we will have a shortage of workforce in the future, and robotics can help us. And uh, I think that the migration policy won't, uh, won't help to replace so the shortening of the uh, uh, labor force. So the robotics may be the one way to accommodate that shortage. And it's companies like this that are spearheading research. Exoskeletons like this are not a new invention, but it may be the first time that older people are being considered as the principal users for doing the everyday jobs such as bending, lifting and carrying. The cost of these projects is a secret, but the results are being tested publicly. This robot can, in theory, lift a person of over 89 kilograms. This prototype is being marketed for those who have to walk long distances those that work in the countryside or in hilly areas such as forestry workers. It's all about maintaining stamina and strength as well as supporting the body's joints. More people can work with the assist suits. People can continue working longer and the devices can allow people who do not have enough physical strength to work again. That's what Kenji wants, to continue working beyond his retirement age. Sahil Rahman, Al Jazeera, Nara, Japan. Well, let's now bring in our guests in London. Gwen Zong Yang, Director of the Hamlin Centre for Robotic Surgery. In Sheffield, Noel Sharkey, Professor of Artificial Intelligence and Robotics at the University of Sheffield. And joining us on Skype from Abu Dhabi, Cyrus Hodges, Director and Co-Founder of the Artificial Intelligence Initiative at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. A very warm welcome to all of you. Cyrus Hodges, what exactly is artificial intelligence? Well, that's a great question, actually. Uh, people um, have uh, trouble, you know, even among um, the, the spheres uh, of people debating artificial intelligence, mm. we, no one has a clear definition of what intelligence is to start with. So uh, to, to get to artificial intelligence, the, the closest definition is what a human can do, um, an intelligence can do. 
But as far as an agreement on what AI is, I haven't heard one from, from my side. And what is the difference between a robot and artificial intelligence? Is, is the eventual hope that the two will merge? Well, that's key. I mean, so robotic is one field, and and uh, Professor Sharkey is, is much better positioned than I am to talk about this. Robotic is one field. AI is another field. AI is really uh, the brain uh, behind robotics. So, of course, we have uh, advances in exoskeleton and and uh, other robotics elements, but the the binding uh, source, the, the the secret source behind it, is the exponential advances in AI that we've been witnessing, uh, particularly this, this, this past year, uh, deep learning and machine learning has made a great stride, and we really at an inflection point of uh, where we're getting uh, with AI. And the, the question that you're asking now are the questions that must be brought to the public debate. And unfortunately, within our policymakers, we don't hear this question that much, and we don't have this debate that much. Noel Sharkey, what can you add to that? Well, I would say that AI, I agree with your last speaker, I would say though that AI, uh, Marvin Minsky's definition is the one I like from the 1950s, mm -hmm. which is it's the science of making machines do things that would require intelligence if they were done by humans. It doesn't mean the machines are intelligent, but it means that the tasks they're doing would require us to be intelligent in order to do them. And that's quite good. And as far as robotics is concerned, the control programs within robots are AI. And AI is is really overplayed at the moment. We have AI in our fridges, in our washing machines. In the exoskeleton you were showing has AI to read the neural signals off the thigh and work the control system. So it's, so it's quite a confusing literature. And uh, the media don't really help because, and it's not their fault, uh, but they spread this whole idea which is sort of sci-fi trope of AI and robotics that doesn't really help us get a clear message across about what it really is. Do you think that's why some people are hostile to the concept of AI? And I'm just wondering what you tell your students who might wonder if there's something lurking behind it that's rather ominous. Yes, I don't, I don't see anything ominous in the sense of uh, super intelligence. Well, not yet. Uh, the scientific challenges for that are absolutely enormous. And uh, as your previous speaker said, we look as if we're an inflection point. Uh, but after four decades in the field, I've seen several bits that look like they're an inflection point. And we have deep learning now, which is like the old kind of learning systems I used to work with in the past. Uh, but now you've got so much more computing power, etc. But a lot of people are talking about these will have limitations and we just haven't reached them yet. So, so we don't really know. I don't see anything sinister. My concerns be more about how much control we cede to the machines, whether they're smart or not. What are we giving away uh, that should be done by humans? OK, we'll talk more about that a little bit later on, but let me bring you in, Guanzong Yang. I mean, obviously, the field of artificial intelligence and robotics is so huge. The potential applications are enormous. Talk us through what you see. I know that you oversee many businesses that deal with this. Sure, of course, that we are all familiar with that uh, from the news stories, autonomous cars and the robots helping in manufacturing, unmanned systems go to places we cannot go or too dangerous for us to go, and also in healthcare. I think what is really exciting is that, uh, you know, uh, we always thinking the robots can be pre-programmed and they can be become intelligent, they can evolve and ultimately that uh, will uh, fight against human. This is really perhaps that uh, we get too carried away in Hollywood films. Mm -hmm. And as the previous uh, uh, you know, guest that's uh, saying, that he, we are, there are many unresolved issues. AI is a very complex uh, subject. And uh, what we really want to see is really how human and the robot can work together. So in the most recent development, as you can see, a lot more research projects are directing towards cooperative control the robot will be able to understand human intention, can work more effectively with a human, can aug augment the human's capability, not only in mechanical force, but also in memory, in terms of recognition, and also hopefully one day that uh, it will also help our you know, cognitive power. And how do we get to that point? Is it through study of the brain? 
Is that a major element here? That's one element that uh, we talk about the neural network and so on, deep learning, and these are all originated from our initial studies, trying to really understand the human brain and also building an intelligent machine. But I think the process is a long one, that for AI, for instance, that uh, there are many hypes before in what we call the AI winters. So the current caution by the scientists is really that to not overhype it, look at responsibly that to how AI is affecting uh, the you know, current workforce. For instance, AI certainly that to make our workforce, the current AI technology certainly make our works, workforce more efficient. But uh, its ability in terms of cognitive power is nowhere near what we can do with a human. It can remember things very, very well, but AI cannot still deal with unexpected things. AlphaGo is a great success, and uh, you know, people then start to think AI perhaps can do everything under a human all of a sudden become inferior race. But it's not like the case for right. people well, that's certainly you know, good uh, to know, working in different profession. Uh, I mean, Noel, let's talk about can do all this, yeah. a, a little bit more about AI robotics in the workforce. That story that Sahel Rahman did in Japan, I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly helping the aging population there. Is that a good thing? Uh, is that sustainable for the population? Yes, I, I think it is, uh, but it's, I'm a little concerned about it. I think the exoskeletons in Japan are absolutely wonderful. The HAL exoskeleton has been rented out to old people's homes now for about three years and really helps people. But I'm a little bit concerned about how much robots are taking over in the workplace. A good example is the new burger bar in California with a, with a robot that can make 40 burgers a minute. Wow, that's uh, and extraordinary. up to 60 and that's really worrying because if you look at how many jobs there are for people making burgers you know college students and uh, people with little education that's one of the one of the things that will go and I'm concerned overall about robots not just he not helping the aged to work for longer which would be very nice I mean if you're a builder or something an exoskeleton would be great you could work till you were 70 but I suspect that a lot of these jobs will be taken over by robots creating mass unemployment and that's a big worry yes because Cyrus you're hearing about the march on the workforce if you've got 40 percent of US jobs will be automated in the next decade I mean this is going to be putting a lot of people out of work that is another enormous sure it problem will, but it will also create new jobs uh, that we cannot foresee right now uh, but you know each time we had an evolution in technology uh, a shift and we are very much uh, at this uh, inflection curve that I was mentioning early on um, you know we transform ourselves without ourselves we bring more jobs that uh, respond to this technology, and that would be linked to robotics, that would be linked to AI, um, and probably uh, the automation that we are seeing right now will alleviate, you know, the, the mundane task that we don't need to, uh, to, um, to, to have upon us and get us to more interesting and probably more intellectually uh, challenging tasks. So I'm, I'm, I mean, you, you, you have two okay stands here. For the uh, one people, is dystopian and the other one is utopian. Noel, what, you, what did you want to say, Noel? I'm just saying, certainly in the past when we talked about computing, people were wor really worried about job losses, but it actually created a lot more jobs. But the robotics revolution is different. When we talk about taking away mundane tasks, we have a lot of people on this planet who require doing those mundane tasks. Not everybody's highly educated. Not everybody can work in the robotics industry. And certainly you'll have people needed to oil the robots and clean them, but not nearly as many as they're likely to replace. For instance, autonomous driving technology, which we're seeing progressing really quickly now. In the United States, that's 35 million jobs. Um, and they're talking about drone deliveries, little robots on the ground doing deliveries. It's all happening at the moment uh, already. We can see it. So what are all those semi-skilled and less skilled people going to do? It's not clear now at all. Well, we saw earlier how the Japanese are using robots to help the elderly. Now, let's move to Greece, where young entrepreneurs see technology as a tool for prosperity. Al Jazeera's John Seropoulos has more from Athens. It's a small step for a robot, but a giant step for Greek industry. This prototype is learning to clear obstacles. At full size and loaded with machinery, it'll be as big as a four-story building, mining the sea floor or laying underwater cable. 
The Greek company developing these legs for a UK client started out with a robot to inspect submerged oil pipelines. It is now at the cutting edge of underwater robotics. Uh, despite the fact that uh, we are in Greece, uh, we combine expertise that is difficult to uh, locate uh, even uh, globally. Uh, so we did this first uh, project, we did a fantastic uh, job uh, there and uh, they, they found us uh, again for this uh, second uh, project. Inora's idea is simple, to build on Greece's greatest asset, its human resources, working strictly for overseas clients, where the money is. Even so, there are problems. Inora is the exception. High-tech startups that export the labour of the country's top talent and earn rewards here in Greece are few. Most companies live in the Greek economy, and that is still shrinking. So 28% of them have disappeared, along with 840,000 jobs during the Greek economic crisis. Greece's most powerful business lobby says constant tax rises on workers are making life difficult for employers. The more you raise taxes, the more you increase tax evasion. You discourage business people and investors, and most importantly, you make life harder for employees and executives, because at the end of the day, they are the ones who will pay for tax increases. Greek workers now pay 40% of their wages to the tax man, and with the latest measures, that'll go up to more than half. Greek employers say they can't compete with foreign jobs markets, which lure Greek workers away. Eventually, experts say, even starry-eyed startups such as this one will have no choice but to leave. What is clear now is that companies are at the, you know, the, the limit of survival. Uh, after six years of recession, after all this instability and the change in the taxation regime, it's, it's now imperative for them to move out, outside Greece, otherwise they will just uh, go bankrupt. For now, Inora is trying to create an export industry here, but it may soon outgrow Greece's ability to nurture it. John Saropoulos, Al Jazeera, Athens. Yang, I'm just wondering how this world can push us to be more entrepreneurial, to take greater risks. In terms of, uh, you know, the job force and so on, I think uh, there are many, many opportunities in robotics. I uh, agree with the point that the robots will affect job, but I strongly think that uh, it will create more opportunities. That uh, the opportunities for us is really that to make it to be more creative, and also that uh, focusing on how do we make our people people's life more much better. For instance, in healthcare, one area that uh, what we try to do is in surgery, for instance. We are no longer satisfied just life being safe, but more importantly, the quality of life after surgery. So there are many things in terms of early detection, quality of life, assistive technologies, and all these things coming through. I think there will be more opportunities that, uh, for us. And we need to be bold in terms of creating new industry or the ecosystem. That uh, My belief is that the robots will be all around us. I certainly don't see the danger robot will take all our jobs, but they will create new ones. And certainly, Cyrus, they'll shatter old business models, I, I should imagine, and economies will need to adapt. Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you can feel you, you questions. I mean, you can feel you understand the massively transformational uh, power of what's happening right now. Uh, um, and again, I'm like astonished that this debate is not in the public sphere. It's, it's not coming from our leaders, um, but it's coming, you know, from people who are interested or working in the field. Um, one question um, that we can ask is the universal income. You know, if there is no more um, small jobs um, um, uh, that are uh, taken upon by humans, but if they are robotized, uh, should we shift this part of uh, the workforce into some kind of uh, universal income. So these questions, policymakers should be asking this now. We should be debating this now. And this type of debate is unfortunately still not happening in the public sphere. Well, I know in Europe, and this is to you, Noel, um, with that growing army of robot workers, there's a discussion that they could be classed as electronic persons and therefore liable, the owner will, is liable to pay social security for them. I mean, could they become tax payers in the future? <laughs> I'm sorry, I have to say, uh, that's, I would say that was nonsense. 
Um, it's a sort of bit of a fantasy and, and it masks the real questions that, that the other two have just brought up. There is the idea of a basic universal income and of course there's a lot of innovation going on. This is a great time for startups and robotics. But, you know, we really have to have a broader societal discussion about this. Uh, as both speakers have said, there's, there's no joined up international thinking and certainly not in the UK. In the UK, for instance, the British government and Amazon have got into be bed together now and using Britain as a test site for drone deliveries. There's been no discussion throughout the country about this, so just going ahead and doing it. And this is where it's, it's a bad idea because the benefits but could when be it comes enormous. To I mean, for instance, we've just heard it. Uh, uh, at the fact that there's no real framework at the moment, is that what you say? Yes, there's no framework at all. Nobody's really thinking about how this all joins up. I mean, there's already, uh, next month, Sky, uh, Sky has a company called Starship Robots that's going to start deliveries with little ground robots. Domino Pizza's already doing that as well. And now you're going to have drones overhead. And there's no discussion about where they're all going to go, whether we want them, whether you want to be caught in the, in the highway of drone deliveries because it's going to be 100 feet wide and then them shooting off. If you're caught in that highway, your house prices are going to go down for instance. Do people really want this? Do they want their privacy intruded? We need to ask because otherwise it could all come unstuck and then we won't get the great benefits that we really want. And Yang, that raises the question I of how you agree. police, uh, how you police this because <laughs> we still have no idea how far it can go. Absolutely. That, uh, no, I have to disagree with you on this one. That in fact, the UK governments are putting that you know, uh, effort together. For instance, EPSRC, which is the funding body for engineering and physical sciences, and really put together all the different strands that in terms of robotic research, not the research itself, but also addressing the ethical issues, the legal issues. And it's really that uh, you are seeing tremendous transformation forward. Now we have a very career focus in terms of national strategy for robotics. We have a very clear mandate in terms of our responsibility for the government, researchers, and also that the general population. How do we embrace this? We can't say that you know, this is something we can uh, deny that uh, robots will have impact on the job force. No, but you were shaking your head there. It is changing the job structure rather than yes, the, because, uh, taking over yes, jobs. Because, um, the EPSRC has done a little bit of a strategy and I've been working on the principles for robotics, but it's very minor. And if you look, for instance, at the government strategy document, buried at the very bottom, there's one mention that it might be a good idea to look at some of the ethical issues. There's lots of money going into robotics, but there's very little going into what the responsibility of those developing them and using them are. And this is what's really missing from the debate. We need to be looking at the societal risks uh, what the potential is for damage, ethical damage, damage to human rights, etc. This is what's missing in all these robot strategies. So you can have all the strategies you want, build all the robots you want, stimulate industry, but essentially it's down to the population in the end whether they want to accept it or reject it. And I think we should look at the population now, discuss with them, have a broader discussion, not just a discussion among Cyrus, robotics Cyrus, isn't it elite, too late whether people accept it? Sorry, I'm going to jump in here, whether accept, people accept it or reject it. I mean, we're on that path already, aren't we? AI is here, and it, the, the, again, the impact's going to be um, massive. What Noel's been talking about uh, just, just before, I mean, there is this dialogue on, on ethics on um, AI in the battlefield, when you can have uh, autonomous um, uh, weapons taking uh, life or death the decision. So we're talking about this because that's something real that, you know, major defense contractors, major... Um, um, uh, countries are, are debating and studying and trying to implement and thinking whether or not they should implement it. So this debate is here, but beyond that clear and present debate, there is so much more uh, that we need to discuss on the ethics of AI, and the time is now, really. And, um, and the time uh, is now, and I'm, uh, unfortunately, we've run out of time. It's such a big topic. Gentlemen, thank you very much. <laughs> Gwen Zong Yang, Noel Sharkey and Cyrus Hodes. And thank you too for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at 
AJ Inside Story or mine at Jane Dutton. From me and the rest of the team, thank you for watching.